it's 3 a.m. in Chicago. So uh, I am not responsible for any, any things you ask. If I say things which don't seem right, it's the 3 a.m. effect. So uh, this is uh, essentially some work uh, that I have been doing with a bunch of co my co-authors for the last, I would say, six, seven years. Uh, this will cover three papers that we have written and a few others we are hoping to write. Uh, I have titled it different than what we, what I thought the title should be uh, when Jose had asked me. Uh, but you know, household mortgage debt relief policies and the real economy seems like reasonable, I think. Uh, so in terms of what the agenda here is, uh, everybody knows that there has been huge discussion about household debt being central to the Great Recession. Uh, it's been going on, people have been talking about it. Housing is important on the asset side of households, on the liability side of households, and hence the discussion. Uh, what has also happened for several years now is that there have been a bunch of policies that have been uh, passed by the government to affect household debt, to, to sort of reduce the burden of household debt, if you will. The idea is to stimulate consumer spending, limit foreclosures, because we think foreclosures have negative externalities and so on, uh, provide support to house prices and so on. Okay, so what type of policies am I thinking about? Well, you can think about lowering the rates, you know, the QE or whatever we are talking about. That's broadly, we are trying to somehow get the rates to households so that the debt that they face, uh, that burden sort of goes down. So that's one type of policies. The other policies are more directly targeted towards household debt. Uh, like refinancing oriented policies, you have debt, you have mortgages, the current prevailing rates are low, you lo locked in at a much higher rate and now we want you to refinance this debt at a lower rate so that you have a disposable income shock potentially. Or you could have loan workouts like loan renegotiation if you're distressed under water, we want to reduce the overhang that comes with it, so we have policies for that too. And ultimately the idea is we want to affect defaults, foreclosures, if you have concerns about negative externalities, do something with house prices, maybe affect consumption, and if you think there are aggregate demand effects, hopefully the economy sort of uh, stabilizes and so on, and employment as well. But when people sort of talk about this, uh, what is missing, and that's where we've sort of spent a lot of time working, is that when you're thinking about the stimulus, it doesn't directly go to consumers, at least not immediately for all sorts of uh, mortgage debt. You've got to worry about the type of contracts borrowers have. In the US, borrowers have adjustable rate mortgages, ARMs, or fixed rate mortgages, which is fixed for 30 years or 15 years at some rate. Uh, you've got to worry about who is financed this. Is this something that's backed by government agencies like Freddie and Fannie, GSEs? Or is this moderated through private market? Uh, which used to exist uh, during the boom had peaked. Now it's virtually non-existent. But a lot of borrowers who are stuck in distress had to deal with either of the markets, so you need to worry about that. And you need to worry about if you're thinking about subsidies through refinancing or loan renegotiations, you've got to deal with the lender. Hence financial intermediation as a title, I guess. Now the question is, what are the effects of these interventions? These policies have been passed you know, when, there are, when there's a crisis. You always have reactions, thinking that there is some belief that, okay, uh, if we do debt relief, things will happen. But what are the real effects? We don't really have good estimates. That's our sort of take at it, at least when we started. And why is that important? Because I think it gets at two things. One is this whole discussion about when you have shocks to monetary policy or other policies, how do they get reflected into the real side of the economy through the household balance sheets? We want to understand that, if you really think household balance sheet is important. And second is, I think it gets more directly at the debate about market design. By market design, I mean things like, okay, what sort of contracts should we have? Should we have FRMs only? Should we have ARMs? Should we have a mixture of both? What are the benefits and costs? If you understand this, maybe we have something to say about it, because in bad states of the world, if a contract does well or worse, that has implication on ex ante, how we want to think about providing these contracts potentially, and on other policies related to intermediaries and so on. So that's the broad agenda. Okay? Uh, and here is, I've said this, that empirical evidence is pretty limited, at least the, the way we think about it. 
And the main reason is, if you think about why have people not done it, well, back in the day, no one thought about these things. There is some data in the Great Depression, but people have not really been able to exploit all these different types of parameters because there are too many things moving around. So there is an identification challenge, especially if you have a policy which affects a bunch of households. So you see some effects, but how do you know that those effects were causal or you know, caused by the policy? And how do you tease out the fact that if everybody reacts, what's the reasonable counterfactual? Right? So those two things are always at the back of trying to tease out this uh, animal right in the middle. And the main issue with people not sort of attacking it was also data challenges. We have very limited, sketchy data back in the day, and we sort of try to tackle both these things in the work that we do. So the outline as we go along, and then please ask questions as we sort of talk about these things, is in hindsight, I mean, we didn't write the papers in this sequence because of data availability and so on and so forth. We were thinking about it. But in hindsight, if I had to write these papers again, the first paper would be, does it matter? What matters? Basically, debt relief. And here, the paper that uh, I think uh, gets at it is related to ARM contracts, adjustable rate mortgages, which lock in you for some specific period of time, and then the rate becomes floating and moves with the market rates. Okay? And so there's a paper we wrote, and here, essentially, because the rates turned out to be so low in the Great Recession, that many people who had locked in into these contracts back in the day, the debate at that time was, hey, when these things will reset up, they'll be disaster. But now we are in a different world where they are not resetting up, they are resetting down. So for a person who has an ARM contract and is underwater, house prices, negative shocks have happened, your value of the home is less than the debt, suddenly you're going to get a positive shock. It doesn't require any intermediaries. We are going to try and do something about identification. But the idea here is that if we shut down any other friction and it automatically gave you some amount of disposable income, what are the effects? So that's what I mean by if you get debt relief, does it matter? So that's going to be one work that I'll talk about. And then the question is, did it matter? When I say, did it matter, what, what do I mean? It did matter for ARMs. Well, what I have in mind is that when the government tried to sort of pass subsidies for debt relief more directly, did it matter? Okay? And here the problem is, why it did, uh, given that if I show you the first piece, it matters. Because you have to go through institution, you have to go through intermediaries. So there are frictions associated with intermediaries that one has to tackle. So the first thing here that I'll show you is a program which is the largest intervention in the mortgage market that's happened in the US is called the HARP program, refinancing program. Okay, and the idea was to provide easy refinancing for highly levered uh, borrowers who had taken loans from uh, Freddie and Fannie. Okay? And these are going to be borrowers with different contract types. 80% of the contracts in the US are fixed rate mortgages, not adjustable rate mortgages, so we want to know what's happening for them. This program tackles that, so we're going to ask, did it matter? And the uh, answer is going to be, well, when it was used intensively, you saw effects. How does one? Oh, OK. So you saw effects like this, where no institutional friction is present. But when institutional frictions were sort of operational, this program didn't work very well in certain parts of the distribution, in certain regions, and so on. I will get to that. Similarly, there is another large subsidy that happened called the Mortgage Renegotiation or Mortgage Modification Program called HAMP. Again, the idea here is we are providing subsidies to lenders to go and renegotiate. So why weren't they renegotiating? Well, there are many frictions because of which they were not renegotiating. Like what? One was that the ownership of these loans that they had sold, many of these loans were securitized. When the loans are securitized, the ownership becomes very dispersed relative to you owning the loans. So their incentives to do what might be something different uh, when the ownership is dispersed changes. And uh, so that's one thing. Second is if the government believes that there are negative externalities of foreclosures, that's not going to be internalized by lenders. So the government may want to induce renegotiation by passing subsidies. And the lenders were given subsidies here. And the idea is, what did it do? Did you see effects like that? And so on. So that's the broad plan. I'll talk about these three papers, try to give you a sketch of what we do there. 
but feel free because uh, I don't think I'll be able to get into as many details uh, as, as I want. But this is the broad plan. OK? Any questions? No. It's early, <laughs> so which is fine. OK. So this is the first sort of uh, paper, which basically does it matter. So we're going to look at uh, ARMs. This is joint work with uh, Tomak Piskorsky, uh, Vincent Yao, and Benjamin Keys. Uh, so what are we going to do here? This is, does it matter? So we are going to provide two sorts of estimates. In all the papers, you'll see the same theme. We try to look at something at micro level, where we can maybe do some sort of identification. What is identification? Try to come up with a reasonable counterfactual for the affected group by policy or whatever. Relative to that, what's the counterfactual? Come up with a control group. We can debate whether that control group is good or bad, and so on. That will be the microanalysis. But then when you talk with all the policymakers and so on, they want to know whether there are regional effects, aggregate effects. Is there netting out going on? How much is that? So in all of the work, we will look at regional analysis too, which is aggregate stuff at some regional level, zip code level or county level, and see if you see similar outcomes and so on. So at micro level, we are going to look at uh, household durable consumption, which is basically looking at out auto purchases. That data is available. That's why people look at it. Otherwise, we would like to know about all sorts of purchases people do, groceries and so on and so forth. That data is not available at aggregated level. And some other spending patterns uh, on other sorts of debt and so on. And then at the regional level, we are going to sort of talk about you know, things like house, house prices, consumption, employment, and so on. Okay. Uh, the empirical setting in the first paper that we looked at, does it matter, related to adjustable rate mortgages, is that during the low interest rate period, those who had ARMs, adjustable rate mortgages, which were resetting around the time when the rates are low, got a positive shock, okay? positive disposable income shock. And we are going to sort of trace how their spending pattern changes relative to a hopefully similar counterfactual of control group. Okay. And the important thing here is, as I said, you don't have to worry about institutional frictions. Like what? Borrowers don't have to do anything. They've done whatever they had to do. Now there is no going to the lender and asking for loan renegotiation. There is nothing like, well, we've got to wake up and refinance. We've got to figure out what the refinancing is, where we are going, and so on. That, those are borrower-related frictions, which people have commented a lot in the refinancing literature. Then there is institutions, whether the lender will pass through the subsidies at what rate, and so on. None of those matter here because this is automatic. You just start getting a lower payment because you're resetting to the low rate. And we are going to sort of look at the variation in the timing of resets. So we're going to look at a borrower who resets today, let's say, and the counterfactual is going to be a similar borrower with adjustable rate mortgage who is going to be resetting a few years later or a few months later. And the difference between the two allows us to trace the effects. Okay? At the regional level, then we are going to aggregate these things and say, hey, okay, so suppose you can identify this at micro level. At regional level, what do we do? Let's look at regions and look at the exposure they have to ARMs. Now, that's not exogenous. As I've said, regional stuff is not my preferred sort of thing, but whenever you have to talk about a policy, you've got to aggregate it up. And so that caveat is going to apply to all regional analysis. Uh, so don't uh, get uh, bugged when you see regional stuff. All right, so here is the empirical design in this paper. So the idea is most easily explained by these two groups. So let's call one group 5-1. What is this 5-1 group? So I got an ARM mortgage. For five years, I'm locked in at some rate. And then from then on, every year, the rate resets to a floating rate, the market rate. OK? 7-1 is going to be the control group. What is 7-1? 7-1 is you're locked in. For seven years, and then from seven years onwards, every year you are reset to a market rate. Okay? So these are going to be the two groups. 5-1 is going to be my treatment group. 7-1 is going to be my control group. You can do it this analysis in many different ways. And you know the assumption is going to be that 5-1 is going to behave same as 7-1 had they not got the reset. So that everybody sort of knows. Okay? So the focus is going to be the rate resets during 2008 to 2012. Why? Because that's the time when the rates were really, really low. And here is the idea, treasury rate at the top, mortgage rate at the bottom. So let's say you have a borrower, 7-1 arm, okay? So some number, 5.1% teaser, adjust to 2% plus treasury rate. 
after seven years annually. Okay, so treasury rate moves, your rate at which you reset moves. Okay, another borrower has five one ARM, some teaser rate, and then adjust to two percent plus treasury. But the difference is from five years. Okay, so now the treasury rate evolved over time. We know that, and you know you got to make the payment. You're fixed at five percent and five point one percent as seven and uh, five borrower. You got to do that for two years, for three years, for four years, for five years, right? Now the differences will start between the two groups. First, five one, seven one is still going to pay at the same rate because you're locked in, but five one is going to go down, okay? And depending on how much treasury rate moved, and that's how it much it moved at the top, there is a big change in the rate at which you have to pay these mortgages. These are not trivial numbers. I'll show you what they are, and then that's what the difference between the two groups is going to be sort of start. Another year, 5-1 is going to reset again to 2 plus treasury next year. Now treasury fell a little bit more, not too much, but you know, in the same ballpark, 7 is on, is still fixed. And then from then on, both the groups are the same, right? So our focus is going to be looking at this period and this period, right? And seeing how spending and other sort of things change between the two groups around this time. Yep. So for these guys, they can refinance, but luckily for us, unluckily for those guys, uh, they were very much underwater. So if you're very much underwater, refinancing becomes like a uncollateralized sort of loan. Remember, refinancing rates are low because I can always grab the home, but if the home value is way lower, <coughs> it becomes difficult to refinance. So very few of these guys refinanced. That's the reason the HARP program was tackle the underwater borrower. So yes, um, so we are okay on that, I think. Can I ask one more yes, please. I'm not an empiricist, but I just uh, wonder about your point from the Yeah. I mean, here you have borrowers who at some point in time taking out this five-year, you know, point teaser contract, right? Yeah. But then you have probably another generation of borrowers who's taking out the same type of contract, let's say, you know, one mm -hmm. year later. Mm -hmm. so Yeah, so we, we do that. So we can look within 5-1 or within 7-1. So that's another empirical strategy that one can employ. Yeah, you get very similar, very similar effects. Very similar effects, yeah. Okay, so data, I will not bore you. We don't have much time. All I want to tell you is that there is mortgage data, detailed mortgage data. There's a lot of consumer-specific data, and they've been matched through social security numbers. Okay, don't ask me how they do it but they do it, okay, and I trust them. Uh, okay, so here is in the data, that picture was just, you know, trying to show you a Mickey Mouse version, but here is how it actually looks, okay. Uh, it sort of goes from 5.7 to 3.3% on average during the period that we are talking about. That we think is a big change. If you're not convinced, here is the reduction in payments that we are talking about. So quarters before are in minus, quarters after the effect are in plus, and uh, you know you can see that there is a reduction of about $280 uh, in monthly mortgage payment. Okay, I show you in quarters, but these are monthly numbers. Uh, if I look at what is my usual payment for these sets of borrowers, it's about $1,000 a month. So this is not a trivial number, like a 25% reduction. That's a big number, we think. Okay. Uh, you can do this analysis within the group, different if whatever you like, you get very similar. 250 to 300 range is always there. Okay. What do they do with this money? Well, we can look at auto consumption. That's the only data we have. Uh, here is how it looks. Uh, so we're talking about $30 on average increase, uh, which is 20% relative increase. Relative increase to whatever they are spending on auto. Okay. You get some money, what do you do with it? Well, you can save it, you can consume it in buying groceries and stuff, I don't see that. I see the car uh, purchases, consumption, so I can show you that. The other thing, so this is actually the same graph, but looking at probability of auto financing. That was just showing you dollars. You can also ask, do I start buying more cars or do I do more refurbishing of the same car, what do I do? 
you actually change both, both the probability and how much you, I don't know what you're buying in an old car, but you're buying something, okay? There is consumption. Uh, the other thing we can track very well is you have a schedule to, of payments to make. Uh, do you sort of start paying faster? Okay, so I call it voluntary debt pay repayment. So again, here you see that there's a change. How much are we talking about? We are talking about $17 a month. I think this is small, but you know, again, it's a pretty large increase relative to whatever they were doing before. Okay. All right. So one can sort of look at the data. The data is pretty rich. So you can start looking at things like, okay, where are these effects more or less? Why do we care about this? Because if you look at any life cycle models out there, <coughs> they all talk about, okay, what are people with low income doing, high income doing, you know, lower credit worthiness, who have access to financial markets, how are they behaving and so on. So we can do all that. You find that there are more, these responses are way more for borrowers who are less wealthy. How do we define less wealth? Housing debt, housing as a wealth component tends to be pretty large for many borrowers. So you can look at how much debt do they have, what's the value of the home relative to debt. That gives you a reasonable indication of how wealthy they are or not. So if they are very underwater, call them less wealthy. This is not my definition, the literature usually do, does it. And you can also look at income. We have income data as well. So these responses are much stronger for borrowers who are less wealthy or have lower income, okay? Is there any group that react before? You know, because you know exactly when it's going to So happen. one thing you might think is that, well, you know, like people have done studies with stimulus checks, right? That's the most popular study in the US. We looked at stimulus checks. They were random because they were sent based on social security numbers. No one knew when they were coming. And then we look at the response. Don't find anything anticipated. How could it be? And then you see some stuff happening later, potentially. Sometimes they find something. Here, we looked at anticipation because you know when your reset is happening and if you have some sense, you might start consuming before. You don't actually, okay? The other thing now that you raised, Jose, this question, is this is a bit different than the stimulus check studies because they, they are one-time sort of checks you get. Here it's like you're getting a repeated, to the extent that the rates remain low for some time, you're getting repeated sort of uh, shocks to your income. Uh, so I think that's the reason also why there are some of the responses that we see are persistent and much larger than what you see in that literature. Yeah. There's another difference, you know, because yes. here you also have, you can tell a reshame story to some extent. Yep. And, you know, coming across different states of nature, and it's not clear that anything that we're seeing is not optimal. You know, I think it's called a reshame story, but this would be the optimal outcome. Yeah, extent. I totally agree. Because the check story is really like a pure transfer that tells you much more about, um, you know, some constraint being relaxed uh, because of an income uh, story that would be a little more difficult to see or more difficult to rationalize. Uh, it, it seems to me a little bit cleaner. You know, in this, you, you have two things going on, which is issues related to life cycle and resharing through the interest rate. Yeah. Whereas the check story seems a little more focused. That I agree. That I agree. I think you're right that like there, it's totally outside. Here, it could be optimal. One thing that's a little bit in our favor is that if you look at the discussions on ARMs and so on before, none of them focused on this aspect. Most of them were only focused on the more defaults that happen when rates reset up, borrowers are confused, they don't know these things reset up, da, 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 and that's what was mainly the focus. No. But you're right, and in fact, one of the things we try to say from this is that when people think about ARM contracts, one has to think about this thing that in the low states of the world, you are going to get some benefits too. So when, which is what happened. Which is what happened. Story be the yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So what is the, so in general, what is the note that you have in your head about what we should expect to find? We talk a lot about policy intervention. Yeah. So what is, the, what is it we're trying to fix exactly? What is, you know, and I believe a lot of these stories that people bring into their lives. So the policy idea? emphasis on debt relief was based on that the foreclosures are excessive and there are debt weight losses. People estimated 1% extra foreclosure leads to, I don't know, 10% drop in house prices, which translates into lower consumption, aggregate demand effects, and so on. So that was at the heart of all of these things. But no one knows exactly what the sort of numbers are. So that's the very micro, if you wanted to know, okay, what's we are trying to do here. 
the micro level, that's what one is trying to do. They're trying to figure out different elements in the chain. So for example, yes, ARMs reset, and there is you know, a disposable income shock everybody gets, but how much do they respond in terms of consumption? Do we have some numbers? Not really, all right? Uh, especially because, as I said, the check ones are small in magnitude, much smaller, and one time. So to the extent that we can't still relate directly to those models, you're exactly right, because cannot talk about those models one for one. But there is lots to be learned here, I think, in that sense. Um, so, you know, as I said, it's consistent. We can't say anything much beyond that. Uh, the findings that I showed you were for GSC borrowers, but the findings are very similar even in the non-GSC sample. And uh, Marco DiMaggio and his co-authors have sort of done very similar analysis using that sample, and they find very similar effects. So we know that these findings are applicable not only in the sample that I'm showing you, but in a much broader sort of sample out there. Right? So that, and they are robust to different identification strategies, like within 5.1, only exploiting within 5.1 timing resets, different, different, so on. Okay. So that was the micro analysis. Then you can do a regional analysis. So what do you do in regional analysis? Well, we can construct regions based on how exposed they are to ARMs. Okay. Now this is something that a lot of people who are doing work at the intersection of micro and macro, you don't have a very great identification strategy there. But you look at the exposure, argue that whatever the reason for the variation is possibly not related to outcome variables, hard to do. We can try to do some things, like what I can match on whatever you can think of. I can match regions which vary on ARM exposure, but look similar on other dimensions, and then look at outcomes. Okay, That's what we are trying to do here. So people have used it in cash for clunkers. We've used it in HAMP program and so on. Okay, so I'm going to match a bunch of zip codes on as many dimensions that I can find, except uh, ARM exposure, because that, of course, is the one which I want to use as a shock. And I'm going to look at economic outcomes. Okay, so it's going to be a different diff sort of thing. So here is the map of US with ARM share. What I wanted to just say here is that there is variation. You have regions from 15% to regions which have 65% exposure. Clearly, there are going to be differences in rural versus urban composition, type of borrowers, and so on. So matching is important. Uh, what I also wanted to say was that even within a state, for example, here is a state, you see uh, an immense amount of variation. Okay? So there is a lot of variation and richness in the data that can be exploited. Uh, okay. So here is when you match two groups, you construct a treatment and control group. So here is, for example, FICO score. Okay, this is basically a credit score of a borrower. Higher the score, better you are in terms of making payments and so on. Okay, all I want to say is that before the resets are going to kick in, they don't look that different. They are pretty much similar. Here is the mortgage rate. Okay, six and a half percent in the treatment and control group. You know, not not too different than uh, uh, between either, each other. Now here is what happens to the interest rate. I already showed you before, but I'm showing you again. Uh, essentially, during this time period, there is a big drop, and then you know it goes down. We know this is what the policy was. So the first thing to do is to see how the two zip codes look. I showed you this period when I was telling you that they look almost the same. But you can always sort of look at this data further down. What am I trying to do here? This is like a first stage, if you will. Okay, for macro guys, this is the first stage. You see interest rate shocks. What happens? Well, the group which has a lot of ARMs, everything else the same, is going to see lower payments. That's what this effectively is tracking, that the mortgage rate is going down for the zip code on average relative to the control group. Okay? Uh, okay, and I won't show you the regression. I'll just show you the picture. Here is house price growth. Okay? So here are the two groups, the treatment and the control. Treatment was crappier, okay? But after the shocks start hitting in and you start seeing the treatment group with lower and lower rates, you do see that the house prices sort of come back, eventually even overtake the control group. So that's one thing. The second thing you can look at is auto growth, which I showed you before. Is this something that only shows up at micro? Maybe they cancel out, there is something else going on. Here is the treatment group, here is the control group, and then eventually 
treatment sort of takes over control. You can do this in progression, again avoiding it. You can look at employment growth, okay. So regions, these are the treatment regions and then the control regions, okay. People have looked at employment growth in tradable sector and non-tradable sector, like Mian and Sufi have looked at that and so on. So you can show that this treatment change happens mainly in the treatment sector, uh, mainly in the tradable sector, which tells you it has something to do with the local stuff, which is what we are trying to argue here, okay. But I won't sort of uh, spend too much time on this, okay. So this goes at Tano's question, I guess. So what we are trying to do here is to say something very simple, not very complicated, and maybe the null is obvious that it should. Of course, if you give people money, what do you expect? So if that's your null, which is not too far from how I started, what this is telling us is what are the numbers, okay? So debt relief does have meaningful effects. Uh, what are the numbers? We can sort of talk about those numbers that when a $280 change happens, you spend about 60 or $70 out of that in consuming, in paying down debt and so on, okay? That's important for policymakers. So we think that this then becomes an important component of thinking about transmission of various policies. Uh, you know, the numbers is what I was sort of saying. Now, the caveat is that, of course, GE effects are all out here. Everything is in different diff and so on. So you can only look at counterfactual and then you can look at a treatment group, but if everyone is moving, which we do think is happening, it's gonna be hard to sort of work with that. Now the other thing is to think about welfare. Okay, so some group of borrowers got some windfall. Clearly someone else must have lost out. So who loses out when, you know, you bought these mortgages as rich investors, you bought mortgage-backed securities. If there is a transfer that's happening to the borrowers, which is effectively what's happening, someone loses out as well. Typically, that group is going to be investors who are holding these mortgage-backed securities and so on. Now, why are policymakers not thinking about that? Well, they are. Their calculation is that the marginal propensity to consume for these rich guys is very low. Marginal propensity to consume for the guys we are sort of looking at who need household relief is very, very high. So when we are going to transfer some subsidies from one group to the other, we'll be fine. Welfare will actually go up. Right? So that's something that's going on. Has anybody measured it? No, okay. But this is also behind many of these uh, sort of interventions. Okay, so that was, does it matter? I say, does it matter again? Because no lender was involved here. Everybody got, who had this contract got the transfer and we can see that, okay, this does something. House prices, consumption, uh, employment and so on. So did it matter when government tried to provide debt relief then is the question in a more active way. Right, so that's where we are headed next. How are we doing on time? Uh, no idea. 25 minutes more. 25 minutes, that's pretty good. Okay. All right. So why provide debt relief? This also sort of Tano asked. Uh, most borrowers in US are with fixed rate mortgages, so they're not going to get automatic subsidies. So if we do want to sort of give them household debt relief, need to do some intervention. Uh, one way to do it is through refinancing, okay? So big picture, if you're not aware of what refinancing is and how it works and so on, you're just basically going to ask the borrower to come in and give them a new mortgage at the prevailing rate, which is lower rate right now, okay? So many borrowers, however, could not refinance, okay? You might ask, okay, if my rate is gonna be lower, why is everybody not doing it? Yes, borrowers want to do it, but the lenders don't want to do that refinancing. Why? Because if you are underwater, I am getting an asset which has a value less than what the value of the debt is. So I may not be willing to do it. Or if I'm willing to do it, I will provide you a rate which is much higher than whatever the rate would be if this was a collateralized loan, right? Because this is now unsecured sort of a loan. So I'm gonna give you a high rate. That blunts the incentive of borrowers to come forward and refinance in the first place. So this was a program, HARP, which was passed to sort of cater to this. There was a friction, underwater borrowers are not able to refinance. Let's get a program which will give them subsidy. Other, other way of sort of tackling this is okay, forget refinancing, you have mortgage debt, let's just renegotiate and figure out if we can lower some principal payments, defer some payments right now. The usual way how corporate borrowers work, right? They go to the lender, say let's work it out, let's delay some payments, cut some payments. Why does the lender agree? Because they think it's enhancing, otherwise 
the negative externalities of foreclosure or bankruptcy is so high that they say, okay, this is a better thing for us and we might get something on the upside, so they agree to do it and so on. So why were they not doing it? Well, there are some frictions. Again, ex ante, if I have a securitized arm's length contract, it's optimal, like many theories out there. Why? Because I don't want to have the soft budget constraint to renegotiate ex post because that preserves my ex ante incentives to pay. But if you are in a state of the world where a very bad shock has happened, which everybody agrees, renegotiation can be useful. Like, you know, Patrick Bolton and Rosenthal have uh, a study which sort of gets at that and so on. So that could be one thing if you think that there are dispersed owners who might not agree right now, but there is some benefit to doing it, we might want to think about that. And if there are negative externalities, as I mentioned before. And the level of renegotiation was pretty low. There were also other factors like asymmetric information. I don't know whether you're going to pay, and that can create huge havoc uh, in terms of figuring out how much renegotiation to offer and so on and so forth. So the government passed HAMP. Okay? So that's the second program. So the, this, is, this slide is just to sort of repeat and tell you this is the full form. HARP is Home Affordable Refinancing Program, and HAMP is Home Affordable Modification Program. Okay? That's it. Both programs need lenders to provide refinancing and renegotiation. So that's where the friction is going to come in. Okay? So here is the first sort of study. So did it matter using HARP? So this is uh, with <coughs> another set of co-authors, um, Sumit, Jean, Sufla, Vincent, and Tomek. Okay? Uh, so mortgage refinancing, consumer spending, and competition, evidence from HARP. So what are we trying to do? Two big things. And then I will tell you a little bit about micro strategy and micro stra regional strategy, and then we can ask questions, and then I can go to the last one. So we're going to do program evaluation again. Okay? At the micro level, I will need a counterfactual. So there will be some borrowers who will be eligible for the program. It's not like stimulus checks, unfortunately. It's not like ARMs as well. ARMs is a very clean experiment. Here I will have to really look for control borrowers, which are not going to be completely exogenous, but I'm going to try and match and so on and try to convince you that the effects we are finding are reasonable. Reasonable how? Because we can compare it to the estimates from ARM when things happen exogenously and see how off we are, if, if you will. We can do the same analysis at the regional level based on eligibility of the program, how much a region was exposed to this program and so on. And then the second piece we do here is that I'm going to show you that when this program was used by the borrowers, when subsidy was provided, you saw very similar effects like ARM. Okay? But this program was not taken up as much as the government expected or everyone else was expecting. Okay? About 3 million borrowers went under this program, which is a big number. But people were expecting this number to be somewhere between 5 and 6 million. Okay? So half the rate at which people were expecting. Why? Many reasons have been proposed. We are going to argue one such reason has to do with intermediary competition. Okay? Why is intermediary competition important? Because if the market is not very competitive, and if I'm going to shave off part of the subsidy to you as a borrower, you as a borrower have less incentive to come out forward and try to refinance. If you look at the literature on refinance, it's pretty long. It's the last 15 years people have worked on it. But most of the focus when they've looked at refinancing decisions of borrowers has been, well, borrowers don't seem to be taking benefit of lower rates relative to whatever they locked in. Okay? So people find that if you look at the rates at which people have locked in, Relative to the prevailing rates, they don't seem to step forward. Even if they have collateral, which means they are not underwater, they don't seem to step forward and say, hey, let me refinance. And why people say, well, it could be inattention, it could be uneducation, you know, whatever. People have sort of labeled all of these things together and called it inattention. Okay? How much do people think are these costs of inattention? People generally think that you need about 100 basis points for people to wake up. Okay? So that's the range that we are talking about. You have some rate. Yes, I see the current prevailing rate is low, but I am not going to move on average till this rate lowers by 1%, 100 basis points. That's the general consensus. So that's something that, of course, is going to hamper any policy. If the lender is going to shave off some of the subsidy, and now you are in the range where whatever the difference between the prevailing rate and the subsidy is less than 100 basis points, you may not step forward and try to refinance. So that's the whole point, idea that 
competition can hamper effectiveness of this program because it can shave off part of the subsidy. And if it shaves off part of the subsidy, yes, you get less benefit whenever you refinance, but you also, many of you don't step forward to refinance because the incentives are not there. So we're going to see both of those effects. Okay. So this was a program which was passed in March of 2009. It's still going on. Uh, as I said, these were indebted borrowers, lots of debt, okay? Related to fixed rate mortgages, not ARMs. So you got to do something active, otherwise you're fixed for 30 years. Uh, and with very little or negative equity, as I said, more than three million borrowers have refinanced, less than five to eight million, okay? Now there's an eligibility criteria. You got to have taken the loan from Freddie and Fannie and your, you must be close to underwater, which means your loan to value ratio, which is how much debt relative to value of the home, should be very high, okay? Was 80, was capped at 105, then was released and so on. So, but that's not important uh, for, for the purpose of this talk. Okay, so what are we going to do? Again, the same sort of thing that we did earlier. As I said, the only difference is the control group is not going to be super ultra clean like uh, the ARM experiment. So we're going to exploit program eligibility to form control group to get the counterfactual and the regional level. I'm going to identify exposure of regions to the program based on how many eligible borrowers you have. So essentially all you need to do is in a zip code, see how many borrowers borrowed from the Freddie and Fannies of the world and how many of them had loan to value ratio greater than 80 before the program kicked in. So you form that group and then look at the zip codes match them on every other dimension, and then trace the outcome once the program kicks in. Verify that those who are eligible do actually end up taking the program, part of them. In what does that mean? That groups or regions which are more exposed are going to see more reduction because of refinancing. And the other region, which is going to be the control group, is going to see less reduction. And then you can look at the difference between the two to trace out the outcomes. Okay. And then at the competition level, I'm going to see how the pass-through varies relative to a more competitive market, okay? So that's going to be the challenge there. How do we identify a more competitive market? Okay. Data. Great data. Okay. Here is uh, just a summary plot, okay? So this is when HARP was started. Here, nothing, of course. And then this is the quarterly rate. Now here is where the cap on, we were capping how distressed you needed to be. So you needed to be distressed, but not very distressed. And then at this point, people realized that, well, maybe we need more, so they released that cap, and then you see a bit more. On average, we are talking about 1.5% uh, of borrowers every quarter, okay? Uh, now, if you add this up, you get numbers which have been released by Treasury, so which is fine. Now, one thing you usually worry with any program is, okay, you're going to see some effect in the eligible group, but what's the counterfactual? Maybe they would have gotten this refinancing anyway in the private market, so all you're doing is substitution. Yeah, you refinanced here, but you didn't refinance there, so on net, we are not adding something. So that, that's why you need a counterfactual. So what's going to be my control group? So what I'm going to do is, the treatment group is 30-year mortgages who borrowed from Freddie and Fannie. We are going to look at a 30-year mortgage borrower but in the private market, okay? Private means we are not going through Freddie and Fannie, with very similar FICO score, interest rate, LTV ratios, and so on, okay? Now, why is this not, why do I keep saying that this is not ultra clean? Because at the end of the day, one borrower decided to go to one market and not the other. So clearly there is some difference, but to the extent that that difference is taken care of in the interest rates and so on, and we are gonna match on those, we are hoping that that will take care of it. And the other thing we are hoping is that the rates at which any of these differences are, are going to be constant before and after, in the sense, yeah. So what's your sense, is this a question of ineligibility in the first place, or like really a conscious decision, like a choice to go to <coughs> non-agency? So these programs were passed way into the recession, right? No, be before, before. So uh, whether they want yeah. for agency loan or, or not uh, is, like if someone is eligible to go for agency, would they always go or? Sometimes people prefer not to go to agency because agency requires a lot of documentation. Now you might think that, well, documentation, okay, so these guys must all be crappy. 
not necessarily. Many times if you have a bad shock like you have divorce proceeding going on, you don't want to reveal a lot of information. So the, that's how low documentation loans started essentially. So you have a lot of low documentation on this side. But that doesn't necessarily mean these are bad borrowers. Okay? But it has got to do with eligibility criteria, usually is related to loan amount. If you want a very large loan amount, like if you look at coastal areas, New York and so on, where the value of the home requires you to take a big mortgage, you're not going to be able to get all of your debt from GSCs. So you will have to go there. Now, who are these guys? Well, I'm guessing Tano, if he has a home, probably went to a jumbo mortgage, which is, so he's not a risky borrower. That's me. <laughs> he's not a risky borrower, right? So uh, that's how, how you sort of want to think about it, yeah. But there is also going to be a bunch of borrowers who, even if they disclosed all information to GSEs, would not qualify. Right? So those will then again probably end up in non-GSE. So that's why those are the groups that we need to sort of worry about a bit. Okay, so here is the two groups. Uh, you know, we match pretty well on LTV. FICO scores, you can see, pretty similar. Interest rates, similar. Balance amounts, similar. So you can see that, you know, we are not that off in terms of finding a group of loans which we think are comparable. Why are we doing this? Because I wanted to see if there's a net effect of refinancing. Maybe all that's going on is substitution. So how do we do this? We look at a control group and see what's the refinancing rate for those guys. And then we look at our treatment group, eligible group, and see what's the refinancing. Look at the difference. That's what this is with standard error bars. And you see very similar stuff that I showed you before. Why is this happening? This gets back to the question that was asked before, that how do, does was refinancing happening for ARM borrowers, for example? Were they refinancing and so on? No. Refinancing was very, very shut down in general around this time because lots of borrowers were indebted and that's the reason you see very similar effects. Even though you have a control group, refinancing rate in that control group is so low that when you difference these two things out, you still get the same effect that I showed you in the simple plot earlier. Okay? Uh, okay. I'm going to skip the table. You might want to ask that when refinancing happens, like with ARMs, we saw $280 drop. How much drop are we talking about here? We are talking about 1.5%, 140 basis points. Okay, That's more than 100 basis points. That tells me that people are going to want to refinance. Remember, I told you 100 basis point range. That's on average, but let's go with that. In terms of mortgage payments, how much are we talking? These are FRM borrowers, different borrowers than ARMs. With ARMs, I showed you $280. Reduction in monthly payment, this is $880 in per quarter, okay, uh, which is a big number, I think. Uh, so we're talking about $3,500 per year. Uh, you may want to see how are these effects showing over time and so on, and what are the effects on consumption. So let me show you a few pictures, which are very similar to what you saw before, so we can just go there. Here is, when you got the reduction, what did you do with it? You got $3,500. Do we see similar effects like I showed you before? Here is the quarter of refinancing, quarters before, quarters after. This is not 2009, guys. People, people take these, this program at different rates. You saw that, right? So I line them up. That's happening at different times. And then see what the response is. Uh, so this is the probability of buying a car, which is a large effect. Here is cumulative. This is like quarter by quarter, you can accumulate it as well. And if you look at what are these numbers equal to, it's like 10% relative to whatever my rate was before the program kicked in. So I get some money, it changes the rate at which I uh, get to uh, uh, my car spending. You can look at it in dollars, <coughs> okay? Again, the effect is there. And you can accumulate it, and you're talking about 20% of the extra liquidity. What extra liquidity? $3,500 per year goes into spending on auto, okay? Which is very similar to, the effects are similar to what we see in ARMs, conditional on you refinancing and getting the subsidy. You can ask, is there heterogeneity in these effects? And you're gonna see that the effects are stronger for guys with more debt and for guys who are less credit worthy based on credit scores and so on. Okay, so very similar to what I was showing you before. Okay. Uh, 
usually people worry that, okay, you're showing me some consumption effects, there is refinancing. Even if we think refinancing, I have a reasonable control group. Do we really think this consumption is because of refinancing or it might have happened anyway? Maybe I was planning to consume anyway and now refinancing happened and you know, you are just saying that refinancing leads to subsidy, leads to consumption response, maybe it's something else. So one way in which people usually check for this, like people did with cash for clunkers, is to see that if there is a consumption response today, which is all because I'm deferring stuff or intertemporally smoothing, you should see a trough somewhere in the future. In cash for clunkers, it was one for one. Here I showed you these effects are persistent over time. So this is not like I'm just consuming today and then just going to do less consumption tomorrow. That's not what's going on. Okay? I can show you these effects related to the control group as well. Okay? Which, again, to the extent that the control group is reasonable, uh, is, is a good sort of uh, uh, check. And as I said, the findings are going to be very similar to what we saw with ARMs that I showed you before. So that tells me there it was exogenous clearly. We are finding similar magnitudes. Okay, we are not doing that bad, I think. <coughs> you can look at <coughs> regional evidence. Again, same idea as before. What is the exposure variable going to be? Exposure to this program. How many eligible loans do I have in a region before the program kicked in? Okay? More exposure treatment group, less exposure control group. Here is auto sales growth. Okay? So you see effects in the treatment group, the solid line. Here is credit card spending growth. This is actually now getting at non-durables. We have some data on non-durables in this sample. So we can look at that. Uh, starts low, goes up. Uh, so what's the summary? I have 10 minutes and I have 50 more slides to cover. Um, so I need a subsidy. Okay. <laughs> So the program did have effects at the micro and at the regional level to the extent that you uh, agree that our strategy is not that crazy. But there is this conundrum that a huge set of borrowers did not step forward, right? And as I said, it has to do with how much subsidy do we think they were getting. Maybe the outreach was not good. Maybe they were not educated. Maybe there was not as much uh, exposure to the program these guys got and so on. So we can look at the effect of competitive frictions, okay? So the source of tension is borrowers want a low rate, lenders want to charge you potentially a higher rate. Why? Because these loans are sold to the Freddie and Fannies of the world who sell it to the investors. So the investors can get in a loan which is effectively insured by the government at a high rate, they would prefer that because the value of the bond is higher. Uh, so if the lenders, and of course if they can get some subsidy for themselves, why not? Uh, the question is, does that change the way in which this program works? And we think it does. Okay. Uh, two reasons why competition could be an issue in refinancing market. It's exactly like how cor corporate borrowers are. If you have a lender where you're locked in, and the lender has some informational advantage, you're locked in. right? People have sort of shown this in corporate settings too, that when you're locked in, they can actually even hold you up. Because if you have to go to another guy, uh, let's say, you know, I have... Uh, two lenders, JP Morgan and Bank of America. If I'm coming from JP Morgan and I go to Bank of America, Bank of America will have to process this loan, think a new, completely new set of terms and so on, and they might charge me a higher rate. As an incumbent, I have a range over which I can sort of hold you up because I know that there are these costs of going to a new lender. The program also puts some more competitive advantage for the incumbent. Why? Because they had something related to legal uncertainty. I don't want to get into the technical details and so on. We can talk about it. But let's say there is some safe harbor that the incumbent lender gets relative to a new lender. Why? Because they were thinking that let's quick start this stuff. People are worried right now that there might be some lawsuits and so on. No, no, you have safe harbor. If you are the incumbent guy, let me give you a safe harbor. What it does, however, is reduces competition even further because now Bank of America knows that, you know, I don't have safe harbor, you're a new guy, I don't want to do it. All right? And then they changed this policy at some point, we are going to exploit that. But both these things did play a role always to sort of affect information, uh, competitive advantage of the incumbent. And as I've already said that like if the subsidy is going to be low, there are going to be two effects. One, conditional on refinancing, let's say you decide to refinance, all the effects I show you 
depend on you getting $3,800 of subsidy in a year. If I reduce that subsidy, the effects are going to be smaller. That's one effect. Second is a lot of borrowers are not going to step in to refinance because you're shaving off and bringing me close to my 100 basis point range. This is going to be a big problem, especially for borrowers who are very indebted. We show that actually. Because those borrowers are right at the margin of that 100 basis point range. Okay? So the effects are very big for exactly the target audience we have. Okay. So problem when I'm sort of analyzing this is I need a comparative benchmark. If I tell you here is the rate, how do you know that's not the competitive rate? Right? So I need some benchmark. So we're going to peg it to the rate of refinancing relative to whatever was the purchase rate or the original rate that's being offered in a different market. What different market? We'll call it the conforming market. Okay? It's not important what this market is. The only important thing for you to sort of remember is that in the Freddie Fannie space, we are talking the, about this program operating in the very highly indebted market, right? Borrowers who are very indebted, that's where this program kicked in. Now, they are going to get some rates, some subsidy. What's the counterfactual of competitive rate going to be? Whatever refinancing is happening in the less indebted part of the market, okay? Now, you might worry that, well, okay, there's a wedge between the two. That wedge is going to reflect the fact that some are indebted and some are not indebted. Of course, that's going to reflect. But we have the exact calculation Freddie and Fannie do to account for credit risk. So I can take away any effects of borrowers in this entire market which are driven by credit risk. So then what's going to be left is just lender fees, essentially. And I'm going to try and argue that the lender fees in the market where subsidy was supposed to be passed is higher. And it sort of increases in regions and in borrowers where the competitive effects are muted. There's less competition. And this effect is going to be blunted once the legal safe harbor was removed. Okay, so that's basically what this whole plan of this paper was, which I'm not going to be sort of having time to finish this. But there's a spread between the two markets, as I said, harp and conforming spread. One minute, I need some more spread. Uh, okay. So here is the fee, if you will. Okay. This fee taking away any credit risk, guys. Okay. So this is without credit risk. Okay. Uh, goes up as your debt goes more. Why? Because if you're indebted, think about like in the corporate setting. If you're a borrower which is very indebted, has a lot of soft information, you are locked in even more. That's the idea here. Another way of looking at it is how many new guys am I going to as a borrower? If I'm very indebted, 80% are just stuck with the old guy. Okay? Whereas here, We are talking about 50%. Just to give you a sense, in this refinancing market, about one third in general are always done by incumbents. Only one third. Here we are talking about 80%. Okay? So that's the sense in which you're locked in because of various things. Now, here is that program which re removed the safe harbor. Okay? So what I have plotted here is just the spread. Okay, spread between what? Very indebted guys and less indebted guys in the same market taking away the effect of credit risk. If I plot it over time, you see around the time when the safe harbor for the incumbent lender is removed, the spread goes down. Spread goes down and you have a similar picture for more borrowers coming in to refinance because now they are getting more subsidy. Okay? Because I have one minute. Let me just skip through about 100 slides. Okay. All right. So let me sort of conclude. I couldn't talk about the third uh, stuff, but some of the findings will come out here and I'll, I'll tell you what they are. Okay. So the first thing which we try to argue here is that borrowers and regions exposed to mortgage debt relief did see effects related to spending, did see changes in outcomes related to house prices, foreclosures, and so on, and saw relative improvement in house prices and employment and so on. So it tells you that when mortgage debt relief does happen, there is an effect in the real side of the economy through the household balance sheets. Right? So that I think we sort of established. We can talk about numbers. Some 
studies have more cleaner numbers than others, but they are all in the same ballpark. The second thing which comes out of this is that borrowers with lower income and high debt respond much more. So as I said, a lot of belief of policymakers has been about redistribution from investors who basically are the ones who suffered, whether it's refinancing, whether it's loan renegotiation, whether it's a reset to a lower rate. Investors who are holding these mortgage-backed securities, which are backed by these loans, are the ones who are losing out. But to the extent that they have a higher, lower marginal propensity to consume, it's a transfer from those guys to borrowers who have a higher marginal propensity to consume. And this redistribution channel could be an important channel, therefore. Okay, so now there are some theory papers which are trying to talk about this uh, and sort of arguing that these are sort of important things. Okay. The second thing which comes from these studies is that institutional and contractual frictions can hamper how effective these policies are. Now, this debate didn't happen much. There was no debate in the Great Depression. In the Great Recession also, in the beginning we didn't have, now we have some of it going on. So the paper that I was talking about, the HARP refinancing program, there is limits to competition between intermediaries which affects this. The loan renegotiation paper, which I never showed you, had a very similar flavor, eligible group, uneligible group, how much subsidies passed. When used effectively, you see responses, but a lot of borrowers never got to see the loan renegotiation. Why? Because there is a different friction there. We argue that some lenders are just not catered to renegotiate. Okay? Some lenders just had a different business model. Their business model was, you know, you get the payments and you channel them and that's it. And to expect them with thousands and thousands of borrowers to suddenly change their shop and do renegotiation, which is very human intensive, requires training and so on, is not that easy, especially in the middle of the crisis. So that's what I mean by limited organizational ability to conduct renegotiation, which is an intermediary specific effect, which is what that whole paper is all about, that intermediary specific effects can matter in big ways. And as a result, chances of millions of borrowers were affected. Okay? So as far as institutional frictions are concerned, the takeaway is then that the policies that rely on intermediaries to do something, like subsidies through refinancing, loan renegotiation, and so on, have to think about competition. Okay, and what they are doing, because that affects how much subsidy is going on. And the second thing which people haven't talked much about is that if we think some organizations are better equipped to, to do certain things in certain states of the world, we may want to think about state contingent control of what sort of actions will happen on debt in which state of the world. So it's like pretty much like a SWAT team, you know, when there's bad stuff happening. You don't have normal cops going in, you have a SWAT team coming in and they clean this stuff up. So similarly, if there's bad stuff happening, you want to have the control move from whichever lender has given you whatever debt because they are very used to doing things in the good states of the world. In the bad states of the world, the control has to shift to someone else who are good at dealing with renegotiation and so on if we really want the policies to have a bite. So that's one thing. As far as contract design, last slide. Okay is, and this gets at Tano, Tano got this idea long ago, I am so jet lagged, I am just getting here. <laughs> that if you have a state contingent contract like ARM, it does get to this whole debate of, should we have ARMs, should we have FRMs? The one side of the story was ARMs are bad because they reset up and then borrowers have no idea what they are getting into and it's a disaster. But then it has a flip side during bad states of the world at low interest rates, we completely circumvent intermediary frictions, competition, borrower inattention, everything, and can get the transmission into the real economy much, much quicker. So when you're thinking about contract design and what sort of contracts to have or not have, this needs to be pretty front and center, we think. So that's all I have. Sorry for going over. Very good. Thank you very much.